Okay, while we're waiting, if you guys, this is also the link to it. If you, oh. Okay, all right, so we're very, very lucky today to have Dr. Sean Anderson, who is the senior faculty in our Environmental Science and Resource Management Program. And we're very especially lucky because uh, he's actually on sabbatical this year. So, I'm hiding, I'm not really um, here. So um, we're doubly blessed with his presence. Uh, so Dr. Anderson is an expert on many things, uh, <laughs> and including fire ecology and residential ecology and marine ecology and many other things. Uh, but he has a particular interest in oil, uh, oil spills, and, uh, and I hope he's going to tell us something about his work in uh, the Gulf Coast in Louisiana. Um, but also, there's a lot more of this uh, that is closer to home. So we gave you a little bit of setup last week, uh, talking about production in California. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Amston to tell us more about oily beaches. So, like uh, Dr. Steele said, I'm on sabbatical, so I'm not really paying attention to time these days, so I could go super long, so I will try not to go super long. Um, by all means, you guys interrupt me if something I say isn't clear, um, and uh, we'll get going. So uh, Dr. Steele asked me to talk about, you know, in general, oil spills, beaches, that kind of stuff, so um, that's what we'll do. So if you guys have finished that quick survey, I appreciate it. Thanks. Um, I looked at most of people's responses a few minutes ago and it, and it seemed good. Most of you guys seem to be not ESRM majors or minors and stuff, which is, which is good. So you guys haven't heard some of this stuff before. Um, so this is what we'll talk about. So I'm going to give you a real quick intro to oil 101, like what it is and, and where it comes from stuff. And then I want to spend a decent amount of time talking about how we think about oil spills because it's really, really, really important. So you heard from the other Dr. Anderson last uh, on, Tuesday. on Tuesday, right? About rhetoric, and this is a great example of how important rhetoric is. It completely has driven everything there is about oil spills. Science doesn't really drive it. The perception of the public drives how we respond and how we think about these things, uh, much more so than just about any other topic I work on with the possible exception of microplastics. The, the, the microplastics are starting to rise to, this, to the level of uh, oil spill kind of uh, 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 interactions. But um, anyways, we'll talk a little bit about conceptualizing oil spills, then we'll spend some time talking about the thing that defines everything there is about oil spills in the United States, was, which is the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. So you have to really understand that if you want to understand any of the subsequent oil spills and how we think about oil spills and stuff. And then we'll see how slow I'm going. And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about impact. If we have time, we'll talk about Deepwater Horizon and the Refugio oil spill. If not, we'll just hit them really briefly. And, and I have tons of videos on my website if you guys are so curious about those things. So, so that's the plan for today. Um, <coughs> cool. All right, so let's talk about, uh, so Dr. Steele might have already hit this a little bit, but I'll just, uh, just we're on the same page. So where does oil come from? Everybody thinks that oils, oil comes from dinosaurs. It doesn't. Oil comes from brackish water and nearshore marine phytoplankton. So these are not the big giant Tyrannosaurus rex type sources, but little teeny single cellular dudes floating in the water that died, sunk down, and were incorporated into the sediment. And um, uh, over the order of at least hundreds of thousands of years, probably more like millions of years, um, and they get incorporated and, and all kinds of funky things happen and uh, they and, and geological time happens and mountains rise and plates move, etc. And we end up with different layers of rock underneath us of different thicknesses. And so what I'm showing you here in this cartoon is essentially where we get oil and gas from. Let me first say that oil and gas is different from coal. They, they come from dead things. But coal mostly comes from dead plants. Oil and gas mostly come, we think, from uh, phytoplankton and, and these dead single cell floating critters that were in the water. Um, uh, so anyway, so, so the stuff goes down, all kinds of stuff happens, which we don't have time to talk about today. And, um, and we get either oil and or gas or both of them together. And, and this cartoon here shows you the the, the classic example, which we have some kind of porous rock, some sandstone, some, something like that. And then we have something that's harder that creates an impenetrable barrier. And basically this oil and gas forms a pocket underneath that, that uh, lid or underneath that cap. And it builds up. And so we, what we historically do is we go in and we basically stick a straw in there and suck out, pop, pop this cap rock somehow, and then uh, uh, suck that stuff out. Um, historically, we just 
went on the surface and picked it up. So this is a picture from UCSB, uh, near UCSB, near UC Santa Barbara, near um, Coal Oil Point. And this is folks mining um, really, really, really hard crude oil that we call asphaltines, that, that essentially is the kind of stuff we would make asphalt from, the, the stuff we put on our roads, the black stuff we put on our roads. So way back when, um, the Chumash, the native peoples here, their whole canoe technology was built on naturally occurring oil seeps that they used to seal their canoes. So there were certain areas in the area we are, Ventura, Santa Barbara is a classic case around the world where there's so much oil so close to the surface, it would just naturally burble out into the creeks or, or into the ocean or, or um, leak out on its own. And so in those kind of places, you could just go pick it up, right, with, with your hands or something like that. Once we sort of got the easy hanging fruit, the next thing we did was go, was start to drill, start to poke straws into the ground. And um, the sur stuff on the surface is easy. Poking a straw into the ground is a little bit harder. And when we poke a straw on the ground, the pressure of all that stuff that's there in and of itself, just like if we had a carbonated soda and we, we stuck a hypodermic needle into the um, side of the soda can, you know, psh, it, would, it would pressurize, it would squirt out. That was the first thing we did. And now, in most places in the world, we've sucked up so much of the oil, that pressure has, by and large, been released. So now, to get at the remaining oil, we have to do something more intensive. So we have to do some kind of assist to get that oil out of the ground. We have to add our own pressure. Or, if you guys have probably all heard of fracking, we have to essentially blow up the ground to, to get at this stuff. And that's what, that's what this is showing. So here we go. So here's a little uh, illustration. Again, here's, here's the, the, ch the lens of oil and gas. It's, it's trapped by some impermeable, impermeable layer. And the traditional oil rig, you just jam a straw down and stick it into that reservoir and it, and it burbles up. Um, what, what fracking is, is essentially to go into areas where the oil is not concentrated in one giant pocket, but is more distributed, interspersed throughout all this um, uh, different type of substrate. And we essentially drill down and then boom, blow it up and, and crack the ground. We, 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 we make a bunch of fissures. And then we usually will do something like inject sand or other material so that crack doesn't blow up and then collapse on itself with gravity. It blows up and then we, with putting all these grains in this, in this chunk into the ground, we keep those cracks open. And then that allows the oil uh, to, or, or, and or gas to, to come up. And so that's what we call fracking. It's all the same thing, it's just on a different spectrum and, and more intense either utilization of water or chemicals, or whatever, but it's the same basic idea. Um, once we get that oil out of the ground, um, we have to do something to it. So the stuff from places like Saudi Arabia is really, really, um, uh, in, the, in the realm of oil drilling, it's the ideal stuff. It's basically almost ready to go in your tank or into your jet engine and, and run it. Um, we talk about oil, and, and so whenever we get oil out of the ground, that's what I'm showing with this barrel here, this, this stylized barrel. Anytime we take oil out of the ground, it's a, a mixture of stuff. And so, so the lightest stuff, which is shown as the stuff that's closest to the top of the barrel, um, is the kind of stuff we put in jets, the kind of stuff we put in your um, automobiles. As we go down, it gets thicker and thicker, and the stuff at the bottom is the kind of stuff that we would heat homes in the east coast of the U.S., fuel oil, um, or those more asphaltine kind of stuff that we mentioned before that maybe we would use to, to tar roofs or, or do... Um, uh, uh, top road beds, that kind of stuff. So every chunk of oil, every barrel of so-called crude oil, crude just means it's not refined, has a mixture of this stuff. So what we do is we take that out and then we, we process it, um, usually referred to as refining or sometimes uh, fracking, um, not the kind of fracking that we do in the ground. Uh, the first thing we do, the very first thing, especially in places like here in Ventura County, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles County, um, we have to separate out the stuff that we definitely don't want. And while there's many possible things, heavy metals and other stuff, the two most common things that we have in the oil that comes out of the ground um, are, is hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic. So it'll kill you and you won't be able to smell it. And so it's super, super toxic and deadly. So we wanna get rid of that. The other thing is um, other liquids associated with that oil and gas, and particularly in areas like where we are near the ocean, where the, the oil and gas is next to a large body of water or indeed a whole ocean basin, oil can permeate 
that stuff. So it's not pure oil, it's oil mixed with water. So the first step, just like you guys, when you go to put your salad, your, your oil and vinegar or whatever salad dressing on your, on your uh, salad tonight, the first thing you do is shake it, emulsify, get it all mixed up. If you just left it there for a while, it would separate. Essentially, we use some, some physical uh, techniques and chemical te techniques to separate it out. And that first, and so that water, that stuff, it's mostly water. It's a little bit of oil and gunk. That's called produced water. So we used to be able to just throw that out in the ocean because people said, it's fine. Turns out it's pretty massively toxic. Um, but anyway, but, but uh, so the first thing we do is get rid of the, the, high, the, the, the sulfur compounds and we get rid of the excess water. Um, there's different ways to treat it and be, be good about it. And then the stuff that's left over, that's what we do the processing on. The very last step before we start talking about oil spills is how we move that oil around. Either the raw crude oil that's coming straight from the ground or after we've processed it and we're sending it to your gas station or we're sending it to the, the plant to go make some plastic pellets or whatever the case may be. And so uh, there's various ways to do that. We can do that with, with trucks. We can do that with trains. We can do that with ships. We can do that with uh, pipelines. Um, and so that's, so that's the two minute version of where oil comes from. Make sense, everybody, everybody good? Making sense? Okay, good. So la I'll just say one last thing because I'm nerdy. There's, there's another theory of where oil and gas comes from. It's called abiogenic and it's all wrong. So we'll just say that. I'll just I'll say it's, that's not how it works. Okay, uh, right. So you, did, you did or didn't talk about our local stuff? A little bit? A little overview, but you probably okay. know a lot more than I do. So go ahead. Okay, so, so has anybody seen uh, uh, the movie There Will Be Blood? Yeah, so that's basically about what happened in Kern County and in Ventura County. So that's, I mean, it's fictionalized, but that is, we were the epicenter of the first big oil and gas production um, uh, here in, in California. Um, we used to, around World War I, be the number one oil producing state in the U.S. Now we've fallen down to, a, we're about fourth right now in terms of the U.S. behind places like Louisiana and Alaska. So we produce a small fraction of what we historically produce, but nevertheless, it's still a, a, a good amount of oil and gas um, from various fields. And our fields here in Ventura County are still actively producing and, and you know, generate oil and gas every day. Uh, here's a picture of the Santa Clara River Valley. So essentially this is where the Maria fire was, actually still is burning or, or near where it's burning at least. This is in 1928 and it might be a little hard to see because it's dark here, but all these things are oil uh, rigs uh, all over the place. Um, this is a map from our state agency that regulates oil and gas. It's the Division of Oil uh, and Gas uh, GR. I can't remember the other G GRR, but, um, but Dogger is what we refer to it as. And um, so, so every single dot you see here was an oil seep, so a naturally occurring place where oil was leaking out of the ground, or a place where oil and gas folks uh, uh, drove a well to try to um, milk the oil out of the ground. So, you know, our, we're, we're ground zero here for this. Um, again, this is another picture from near UCSB. This is the late 1800s. This is that surface mining of the, the sort of dried, crusty crude oil, the, the really um, ugly stuff. Oh, I forgot to mention, I think I went too fast. There's, there's a couple ways we classify oil, oil and gas. Uh, common ways. When we talk about how we talk about how how much is that light fraction versus how much is the the thick stuff, and so we talk about uh, uh, light versus heavy. So a light crude oil is mostly the the gasolines and the and the small chain hydrocarbons. The the dense the thick stuff would mean it's got a lot of the jazz that is more like tar that you can still turn into gas, but takes a lot more effort to, to convert that stuff there. The other uh, common phrase that you'll hear, the other common denominator, and this influences how much the oil costs per barrel, how much we'll pay for it, and therefore how, how uh, profitable it is to drill for that particular type of, of petroleum. And the other is how much sulfur is in there. And we refer to that as sweet or sour. So the best type of oil is uh, light and sweet. The worst kind is sour and, and you know, thick and, and really, you know, gunky. The kind of oil that we have mostly around here tends to be more of that gunky type stuff, tends to be more of that thicky, thick stuff. Uh, so here you go. So this is like, the, you know, that, that, that really thick stuff. 
Here's another shot. This is coastal now. This is uh, the mesa above downtown Santa Barbara in the 1930s. And again, <coughs> everywhere you see is an oil derrick. Every, and that's a big way to put a big giant straw up and bang it into the ground, essentially. And then we're the first place in the world to do offshore oil drilling. So the folks in Louisiana will have you believe that they did it first, but not really. So um, what we just did, because we had so many of those oil and gas uh, platforms, people just said, hey, it looks like it's going right up to the edge of the beach. Let's put these drills on the beach. And then they said, hey, maybe we can go just into the shallow water. So they started building piers off of places like Summerland and, uh, and just took the same exact technology and built it on top of a wooden pier and then jammed it into the bottom of the ocean and drilled that way. So those are the first quote unquote offshore oil platforms. Not very sophisticated, not very deep, but um, so we have a long history of all these types of things uh, right here. Um, this is the current map of uh, where we do oil and gas exploration. Each of these little grid things is yours. So you guys all own this. This is, this is the American people's resource. And so what we do for minerals and oil and gas is we say, hey, this is a resource for the American people. If you oil company or you gold explorer or you whoever it is want to get at that, um, all good, but you need to bid for it. And so, so there's bids that happen every so often, and the government will, will uh, uh, march, mark off a certain area, and they'll say, here it is. And companies will use their best judgment as to whether they think there's oil or gas underneath that area based on the geological formations and stuff. And then they'll bid, and if they win the bid, they pay the US government a bunch of money for the right to drill. They don't pay per every gallon they take out of the of the ground per se, they rather bid for the opportunity to drill there. And so that's how the process works. Um, we, uh, so the, these are, and, and then if you talked about uh, state waters, federal waters and stuff? I, I okay, so the short version is um, uh, our laws date back to when um, dudes, they were all dudes back then, uh, had cannons. And so the, the law of what was our territory was based on how far away we could shoot a ship from the land. And so, and so initially we couldn't shoot very far, and then we got better and we could shoot farther, then we could shoot farther. And so the current um, uh, definition of what we consider uh, the waters off of our shore is 200 nautical miles. And that was created in the wake of World War II because we wanted to make sure that people weren't stealing our oil quote unquote, or stealing our fish, quote unquote, or taking our underwater minerals that we wanted to go mine. And so we created this 200 nautical um, mile uh, area. So all the you know, 200 miles offshore is, is US ter so-called territorial waters. But the first three miles, the first three nautical miles, those are state waters. And so uh, some of these leases are in state waters. We control that as the state of California. Others are in federal waters. That's controlled by uh, the federal um, executive branch. Right now we have 23 platforms, uh, offshore oil platforms that are in federal waters and four that are in state. One of these is in the process of being shut down. It's not actively drilling right now, but, but those are the platforms that exist. These are crazy. This will never, ever, ever, ever be built ever again in the history of our species. So these are things like the size of the Empire State Building that are underwater. No one builds the, we, dr we drill much deeper than these platforms are these days, but with different technology. We essentially have a floating boat and shoot giant harpoons down to the bottom of the ocean and we anchor ourselves with these giant uh, metal cables. These things are all massive, massive superstructures, literally just like we were building a skyscraper. Um, and and uh, so they're really amazing things. And when I went to, I did my undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, some of my friends, and I was a, a diver, uh, some of my friends went to Santa Barbara City College, which was the top place in the US to become a commercial diver, uh, to work on these platforms, because there were so many of these uh, platforms going in in the 60s and 70s. Um, and, uh, and now there's still a program at, at Santa Barbara City College, but it's a small program. We don't really build these anymore, do much servicing of them. Um, so that's oil and gas offshore. Okay, next, let's see, the, let's see how the volume works here. Okay, so let's talk about, next I wanted to 
talk, is that good? I'm, I'm going fast, sorry, I'm going too fast for you guys, right? Okay, good, makes sense? Okay, now I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about how we think about oil spills, how you guys think about oil spills, how Joe Blow thinks about oil spills, how our society thinks about oil spills. So here's one uh, quick little thing we'll watch. This is about two minutes or so. Begin with breaking news of oh. environmental disaster. Snap, you guys can't hear that. Santa Barbara County Coastline. Good evening, I'm Michelle Tuzzi. I'm Mark Brown. More than 20,000 gallons of crude oil have poured into the ocean from a broken pipeline. Eyewitness News reporter Liam Suter is live at Refu Refugio State Beach with new details on the threat to wildlife and the cleanup efforts. Leanne. Mark and Michelle, there is still a very strong smell of crude oil here along the coast, and there is still a lot of that oil right here along the shoreline. Take a live look. You can see it covering all of the rocks here, but a lot of it has now moved offshore out into the ocean. Officials say they've already recovered 20 barrels of oil from the ocean, but there is much more after that pipeline ruptured. Thick black oil covers miles of shoreline in Santa Barbara County after a pipeline ruptures, sending thousands of gallons flowing out into the ocean. Plains deeply regrets this release has occurred and is making every effort to limit its environmental impact. Authorities discovered the rupture in the 24-inch line owned by Plains All-American Pipeline on the north side of the 101 freeway near Refugio State Beach just before noon. Residents complaining of the strong odor. And when I got out of the, the, the car, I went, oh, Dave, what's that smell? Is there something wrong with the tent trailer? He goes, no, it smells like tar or gas or something. Officials say the oil spilled into a culvert flowing under the freeway and emptying onto the beach and into the ocean. Well, being a local, it's a disaster. You know, I learned to surf right here. So I can't bring my kids here for six months, maybe a year. I don't know. Today's spill stretches four miles along the shore, but officials say it could spread another two to four miles due to the winds. The pipeline now shut eventually. off, a massive cleanup effort underway. Concerned residents scouring area beaches for any wildlife caught in the thick, gooey oil. Um, it's going to get worse, though, because it's going to spread all over the beach up to the high tide line. Officials say so far they have no reports of any animals injured by the spill, unlike in 1969 when thousands of seabirds were killed along the Santa Barbara coast after the largest oil spill in the waters off California up to 100,000 barrels. Early estimates put today's spill at just 21,000 gallons. It's, it's definitely more than uh, we would like. We don't want any spills to happen on our coastline. Uh, but as far as severity, uh, this is considered a medium spill. Due to the danger, officials evacuated the beachside campground, cutting the camping short. Oh, it's horrible out there, and it's sad for the wildlife. I mean, I feel more sorry for what's going on in the ocean than for people that have to pack up and leave. And this heart-wrenching scene captured off the shore, a mother whale and her baby swimming dangerously close to the toxic slick. Officials say they are doing all they can to limit the damage. But we are now getting a look at some of that damage. These pictures from NewsHawk.com showing some of those birds that have been caught in the oil here along the coast. Now, the cause of that rupture remains under investigation tonight. As for the popular beach here, it remains shut down, and authorities say it likely will remain closed through the very busy holiday weekend coming up. Live at Refugio State Beach, north of Santa Barbara, Leanne Suter, ABC7 I. Witness news. So sad. Leanne Suter, thank you for that live report. Begin with breaking. Okay. So that's that's uh, that was a 2015 spill and classic news coverage of an oil spill. Let's watch one more. So this is um, raw footage from 1969. This is the Santa Barbara oil spill that happened. We'll talk about it in a bit, but I just want you guys to watch this. Just about a minute and a half. So this is near the harbor in um, in downtown near downtown Santa Barbara. And that is the harbor. Um, so we, the two quick videos, we watched the one from, we watched the one from 2015. Do that. So we watched the videos from 2015. We've watched some of the raw stuff from 1969. Here's a, there's a two more I have here. So the, the short uh, URLs are bit.ly 
slash beach oil two, beach oil three, beach oil four. Why don't you guys break up into groups of five or six, and then each of your five or six groups, just watch one of these. You guys don't have to watch all three. So the longest one is about two and a half minutes, the shortest one's about 50 seconds. So I want you to watch them, and then I want you guys to talk about together the two videos we've seen, plus that one, what, what, what's, what are the themes, what, what themes are going on there? What are the image, what's the imagery that you see? And then once you've done that, I want you guys to go, here's one more thing to fill out, and I want you to, to fill out your impressions of what the images of an oil spill are, the themes are. Okay, while you guys are finishing that, I'll just note, so this is the stuff from the, the first one, when, we, when I said, you know, just off the top of your head, when you think about an oil spill, what do you think about? And so this is, you know, oil obviously was a lot, what a lot of you guys talk about in terms of oil spill, but, but um, pollution, animal, dark, uh, locations, a lot of people identified Santa Barbara. That's, I, I would say that's, that's good because it's such an important uh, uh, aspect of what's going on. So that's kind of cool. So that's what you guys thought about at, in sort of the generic, um, you know, first principles type stuff. Let's see what you guys just said now. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the visuals. What do you guys think the visuals were? Oil, again, you guys thought oil is a super important part of oil spills. That's good, okay, good, interesting. Um, thick, bird. Okay, so there you go. So, so for example, as we'll see, no one can, it's illegal to do an oil spill story without an oiled bird. It's just illegal. No reporter will ever do a story. They always want to have a bird. Doesn't matter if there's no birds tainted. They, can you have a picture of a bird? Can't believe how many times when we get interviewed at one of these oil spills, like, so do you have a, do you have like a dead bird? I'm like, no, I don't have a dead bird. And like, <laughs> we, have, we have dead sand crabs. They're like, eh, do you have a bird? You know, like, no. So, so that's how important these visuals have become. It's been a lot, it, we've been trained, people have been trained, our society's been trained to think of oil spill is equivalent to gunk on the surface of the water that we can see and, and, and poor widow birds, right? I don't want the birds to get hurt, but, but there's a whole ecosystem out there. But yet birds, for historic reasons, are what people want to see, expect to see. So then this next one is like themes, and, and the, the themes aren't as, aren't as pronounced. So it looks like you guys, so there's much more evenly distributed things. So some people talk about news, some people are talking about uh, cleanliness, some people are talking about... Um, graphics, so okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, um, before I show you what's going on, I want to I want to um, show you guys some data and then ask you another question. So this is uh, if anybody's in coastal or has been in coastal, this is your data. You're welcome. Here's your data. Um, so in our coastal marine management class, we survey folks and we ask them various questions. So some of the data I'm showing you here is from just the last month. This is 2019. I have, didn't have time to, because I'm on sabbatical, right? I'm supposed to be drinking daiquiris and doing things like that. So I didn't update every single one of my figures. So some have 2019 data, some have previous year's data, but it all shows basically the same pattern. So one of the things we, and this is asking random folks, wealthy folks, po poor folks, old, young, everybody in Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles counties. So that's who we ask. And at the top of the slide is how many people in the sample size. So this one is 1,328. It'll, it'll vary with each slide. And this question is, we said folks to folks, hey, what is a stronger, everything might have some influence, but what's the stronger influence on our coastal resources? Is it natural forces? Is it humans? Is it a blend or neither? And 92% of the public say that humans are at least as important as nature, if not stronger than nature. So that tells you that the vast majority of our community sees ourselves as a major structuring force, right? Sometimes when we read the media, some people say like, well, you know, who knows what's going on? No, most people know what's going on. They know that we have a strong influence on that. Um, another one is, uh, I asked you guys this question, and I didn't show you the data, but your data follows this data. And every time we've asked this, and, and I, we only started asking this in the early 2000s. Other researchers have started asking this in the 1970s. It never changes. So, we, so there's all these threats. We can talk about threats to our biological resources and coastal resources. And everything can sort of fit in here. Co climate change can be CO2 pollution. Everything fits into one of these, uh, or almost everything fits into one of these categories. And this is what we see. So this is asking um, fisheries, co overall coast, wetland. Let's just look at the overall coast, this middle one. The greatest threat is to the left, 
the least threat is to the right. Everybody thinks, including you guys, that pollution <coughs> is the number one challenge that we face. Pollution is absolutely a clear challenge. Microplastics, oil pollution, nutrients, all this and that. But there's a host of other challenges. But nevertheless, when we talk about dealing with environmental crises, the public thinks that pollution burbles up to the top and, and is, it should be the first thing we work on. And, uh, and I would suggest that's an important thing, but there are other things as well we should work on. Um, uh, Again, the next one, the coastal governance, a bit different than if you read the national media. 60% of the public thinks that we should be doing more. Our government should be stronger, having a stronger hand in terms of managing our coastal resources, uh, whatever those are. So about two thirds of the population think that. Um, when we start, when we ask about Things in general, how is the management going? This goes for everywhere in the coastal zone and probably anywhere for the environment. But if you ask people in general, how are things going? Most people will say poorly. Most people will say things aren't going well. So in this case, about two to one, people say that we're not doing good management of the coast, right? But an even larger percentage is undecided. The even larger percentage, they, don't, they haven't been thinking about it. They don't have enough information. They don't know. As soon as we start to ask more specific questions, though, as opposed to good, bad, what do you think about thing A or thing B, what we find is um, uh, people are um, much more positive. So in, th in this case, this is after our 1969 oil spill, which we're going to talk about in a second. Um, have we been doing a better job since then? And um, about 30% say we've been doing better, about 13% saying we haven't uh, it hasn't changed since then. And only about 8% say we've been doing worse. So again, um, sometimes in these debates, it seems like everybody is um, undecided or everybody's very negative about environmental protection or enforcement. That's not what we find, at least in our home area. Okay, so the last one, before we get to the 69 oil spill, here's this last question. So here's a question we've been asking all the time. I'm gonna show you the data just from fall 2019. And this is, so offshore oil drilling, which is what we're doing. So right now, the current situation, and that would be keep as is. So that's the option people want to do the same thing we're doing now, which is we're still drilling for oil off the coast of California, but we're not, well, there's some proposals from the um, current presidential administration to change this. But right now, um, we're not allowing new oil and gas leases. So we're sucking out the stuff where the straws are already in the ground, but we're not allowed to put in new straws, basically. Okay. so. Uh, we asked folks, do, should we be expanding, doing more drilling offshore? Should we be, you know, is, is it right to keep it the way we're doing it now? Still drill, but just no new straws in the ground. Should we reduce it or we should completely eliminate it? Or I don't know, I, I can't make up my mind. So everybody jot down their answers to this. Are your guesses down? So in general, how many people think uh, the majority of people want to expand versus somehow reduce? How many people think that the majority of people want, to want more oil and gas drilling? Anybody? Wimps, nobody even guessed this? Oh my god. Okay, how many people think that the majority is going to be more or less as the same? Okay, there's one, two, three, yes, nice, four votes. Put your hand up, it's all good, I'm not going to judge. Good, five. Okay, then how many people think it's going to be somehow shrunk? Or people would like it shrunk? Okay, the majority of people think, okay. So everybody, everybody do this. Oh my god, it's so tense. Oh my god, look at that! 6% of people want to expand. Our error rate this year is 3%, so, so that, that's, that's pretty low. Uh, about a fifth of people think we should keep doing it the way we're doing it. And then if we added the reduced, the eliminated people that want it less, that's almost half, basically statistically indistinguishable from half the people want that. So, the, so um, it's not 100% one way or the other, but the lion's share of folks would prefer we um, uh, not drill uh, off our coastal area. Okay, um, awesome. And if you guys are interested in that, we have all the data. If you're curious as to how, and we've asked how people's attitudes have changed after things like the Deepwater Horizon, et cetera, so we have all that, but, but we're running out of time. Okay, <coughs> so next I want to uh, <coughs> contextualize oil spills for us so we're, we're all talking on the same page. Um, a uh, bunch of numbers here. Um, 
the key thing is I've standard all the, all, standardized all this to the Deepwater Horizon, which is the biggest spill in recent times that, that you guys probably can remember. So that was 2010. There's different units, and I put the units down here, and I can give the, the, these slides to Dr. Steele if you guys want the, the detailed numbers. Short version is there's different units that we speak in. And folks that are trying to convince you that this is not just related to oil spill, this is a very common thing. People that want to make something seem big will use one unit. People that want to make it seem smaller will use another unit. Um, all of these units are used in, in different shapes and forms. Gallons, um, barrels. So a barrel um, is about uh, 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 42 US gallons. And so, you know, like a, a, a barrel, and that's a, that's a US barrel, which is different from, a, from the UK and everything. So, so we have these different numbers, and it, and it can be confusing. So whenever you do look at oil spills, you really want to make sure you're doing apples to apples, not liters to gallons, not gallons to barrels, et cetera. So what I've done here is I've standardized it all. This is the estimate for how much oil was released in barrels. I'm going to have it in gallons over there. Uh, by what's the entity known as the Flow Rate Technical Group, which is a group of scientists that were figuring out how much oil was coming out of the, the rip in the bottom of the ocean into the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And then what I've done is, I, over here on the right, I've standardized everything to that. So th this oil spill ran for three, blowout, ran for three months, basically. Nonstop, essentially nonstop. Um, one other clarifying thing, just because I'm a nerdy dude, um, all these things that we usually refer to as spills, but there are spills and there are blowouts. A spill is what happens when we have a barrel of oil or a tank of gas or a, or a, a container on a barge. A spill has a contained volume of oil that rips open and it releases. An oil well, when that breaks open, we, that's technically not a spill, that's a blowout because we don't know how much oil's there. And the, and the Deepwater Horizon is the classic case for that. We didn't know was there gonna be, you know, a million gallons, two million gallons, three million gallons. So it's a very different management challenge when you don't know the worst case scenario. Something like the, um, in the Santa Barbara oil spill, the 69 spill is the same way. But something like um, the Torrey Canyon or something like um, the Exxon spill, it was, you know, worst case, the whole chunk of oil in that ship would come out, but not any more than that. So there's a difference between a spill and a blowout. Nobody considers that. So, okay, here we go. So um, the largest oil spill in U.S. In, the, in global history is what happened during the first Gulf War. So Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and then essentially to try to cover his tracks and to screw over the people of Kuwait, when they were leaving, they cut open all the oil wells they could find and set them on fire. One, to screw the people of Kuwait. Two, to create these massive black toxic plumes so that U.S. planes and, and satellites couldn't see through that. So it was as, as essentially camouflage. Um, we do not know how much oil was released. It went for months and months and months and formed lakes in the middle of the desert um, and, and spilled into the ocean. So, so the best data comes from this U.N. Um, meeting that happened years afterwards. But... But that is somewhere around 120 to 165 percent of the oil that was released <coughs> in the uh, Deepwater Horizon spill. The Exxon spill, which some of you guys watched that video, that was 15 percent of what happened with the Deepwater Horizon. Um, the Ixoc spill, which is this um, uh, uh, also <laughs> offshore platform in um, in the Gulf of Mexico, but this one was off of um, off of Mexico. That was about 70 percent of the Deepwater Horizon. Um, the Santa Barbara oil spill that we'll talk about next, that was a mere 2% of the deep water horizon. The Torrey Canyon, which happened before, was about 15%. It was a big super tanker. People said, this is the best thing ever. It can't break. And then it cracked open. They're like, oh, damn. Um, and then the biggest one, the biggest oil spill in US history, the second biggest in the world, um, uh, depending, some people say it's the first. Again, it's a little bit. The numbers get a little bit squirrely, but um, was in Kern County. If you guys are bored and you're nerdy, a great thing to do is to, is to cruise out, um, you know, go out the 126, get on the grapevine, go over, get down to the bottom of the grapevine, and you can go to this um, Kern County Oil Museum. It's one of these awesome museums. It's run by these old ladies with blue hair. It's free to go into, 
And it's the story of this insane oil spill called the Lakeview Gusher. It happened 100 years before the Deepwater Horizon happened. It happened in 1910. Massive oil spill. This was back when our technology was much more primitive, and we literally pulled up a big weight and then let it go, and it, and it hit the ground. And you pulled it back up, and it, and long story short, it cracked open, and the oil started flowing, and it kept flowing, and it kept flowing, and it kept flowing, and we couldn't stop it. It created um, lakes that were 30 meters deep, three lakes. Um, people ran out, uh, had time to lay railroad tracks out from Los Angeles, and tourists would go out to look at this giant fountain of oil just spurting up. People threw train cars, people could not stop it. It was, it was, it was crazy. Um, the, the, this picture, these are some guys rowing across the lake of oil, one of the lakes of oil. Insane. What was the environmental impact of that? Who knows? Nobody was measuring stuff back then. So there's a national historic marker, you guys can go to the site of it, and clearly it was really bad for the environment, right? But we didn't have any monitoring, we didn't have any people taking samples, we didn't know what to look for back then. So essentially it ended, and then we were like, all right, let's keep drilling. Here we go. So that's the Lakeview Gusher. So biggest oil spill in California history. The biggest oil spill in US history is not the Deepwater Horizon. The Deepwater Horizon is the largest marine oil spill in US history. So Lakeview Gusher is the largest. Okay, Gazutai. Uh, now let's get to the, the, the classic oil spill, which is 1969 Santa Barbara. Um, themes here. So I'm highlighting the themes on the right hand side. And maybe you guys saw some of this in your videos, right? Um, but uh, firstly, things were very different back then. Regulation was very different. Um, we didn't have an agency that was tasked with just making sure we, as we do now, with safe oil and gas drilling and this and that. So the USGS, the United States Geological Survey, was the closest thing. Folks drilling these, uh, this was Unical, uh, Unical 76, uh, uh, was, was drilling this platform. This is off of um, uh, Summerland. And they said, hey, we're jamming our straw into the ground. Do we have to put a metal casing to strengthen that straw all the way from the top all the way to the bottom? Everybody's like, I don't know. And the company's like, well, because it's kind of expensive. <laughs> do we have to do that? They're like, oh, why don't you put it like, I don't know, a third of the way down or something? They're like, that sounds good. Okay, good. And what essentially happened was the, the surface of the ocean, the, 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 the sediments, the rocks at the bottom of the ocean wasn't super stable. So we drilled in and it, it, started to crack. The first notice that, we, that people got that anything was wrong was an anonymous phone call to the Santa Barbara News Press. So at night, one of these editors was there and the phone rang goes, hello? And this guy said, uh, something bad's going on off of this coast of Santa Barbara. It's like, what? It's like, you gotta look at Platform Holly. It's like, what are you talking about? You gotta look at Platform Holly, click. That was it, right? So there's no automatic notification system that everybody was calling out the Coast Guard or anything like that. Um, what we're looking at here is we're looking straight down on this platform, and what we're seeing is all this oil burbling up and, 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 and fritzing out in all different, direc all different directions. Um, themes here. The first, immense. Uh, can't figure out how to control it. Oh my God, this oil is going to do whatever the oil wants to do. That's one theme. Next theme is that we don't know what the hell we're doing. Truly, our oil and gas industry is amazing technologically. Whatever you think about if we should or shouldn't be doing oil drilling, they are absolutely amazing. The level of technology of flying to Mars with Elon Musk, it is amazing what we, what we can do now. Incredible strides, computing, uh, imaging of the bottom of the ocean, all this kind of awesome technology. Very little effort has been put to clean up in response. Virtually nothing certainly nowhere close to the amount of technology and investment and effort we've put into figuring out how to suck more oil out of the ground. Um, and so what we got was, as you guys saw in the video, this stuff, the picture on the right, all these bales of straw in downtown Santa Barbara. So what's going on? And there's oil on the beach. What do we do? We're gonna throw some straw on and then the straw will stick to the oil and then we'll scoop up the straw, right? <laughs> That's it. Ain't nothing more fancy than that. You saw the guy with the bag? <laughs> right? Lame. Super lame. And then what happened was we sucked up all the oil. 
I'm like, woohoo! Everyone home. Next day, more oil. What the hell? They've got more hay. Threw more hay on the on the beach. Woo 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 woo. All right, cool. We're all good. Whew, man, that was crazy. Next day, more oil. So there's this growing sense that we we cannot. Our technology cannot keep up with this onslaught. Um, what we're looking at here is a U-2 spy plane. So President Nixon, who's the president at the time, tasks one of our classified spy planes to fly over the, the oil spill and, and take a photo of it. That's what this thing is here. We didn't have any technology to go image oil spill, satellite this, or infrared that, or whatever. So, um, you know, crazy things. Having to use Cold War, you know, spy technology to see what the hell's going on just off of our beach. And then, Another theme is the growing awareness of the ecological impact of this oil spill. So as I said, I did my undergrad at UCSB, and this is the trifecta. So this is um, a surfboard. Because everybody's like, surf, that sucks, you can't surf. This is the wounded bird, we already talked about that. Birds are, oh my god. Whoa. And then, you can't quite tell, but this is some kelp, some giant kelp. So the, the fundamental, the foundational part of our offshore, nearshore uh, ecosystem, all oiled. So this is, everything is getting hammered here. Um, the president of Union Oil, in uh, things that you saw echoed there in the Plains All-American, you saw the same thing in Deepwater Horizon, everybody seems to repeat this, or, or almost everyone repeats this. So he gets, he goes, calls a press conference at the harbor in Santa Barbara, and he says, people said, hey, can you tell us about this disaster? And he says, I don't like to call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds. Oh, shit. Right? He said that, and everybody's like, excuse me? Like, F you. And so, so this notion of coming across is totally calloused. And you know, it's not that big a deal. We just killed some birds, right? That sends people's anger into overdrive and outrage into overdrive. Um, we did, we, we try the first cleaning of birds. They all die, or virtually all of them die. The problem is if we're gonna treat oiled birds, we have to get them super, super fast and treat them super, super quick. The way birds and sea otters and many of our, our critters that live on the surface of the ocean um, um, behave is that, for example, our birds, they have oils and their feathers need to stay very tightly um, uh, folded on each other. And so they create little micro spaces where they have little insulating layers, right? So that's why you always see a bird preening, <coughs> always cleaning their feathers. You get some oil on it and now it no longer forms that nice protective layer and cold water can get to their skin. So they get colder and they get hypothermic. So they can die, for, either, normally they wouldn't die, but now they could die in that water because now they're getting colder. So what do they do? They start to lick it, right? And start to preen it and they ingest that oil. So they'll poison themselves with the oil. So you might get them and they might be okay and you treat them and you get all the, the uh, oil off their feathers, but then in a day or two or whatever, they, they die because of um, the, the toxicity that's been ingested already. But people are trying that. It's the first time we tried to do that. Um, and then this huge, unprecedented media firestorm. So let's be clear. Santa Barbara, rich, wealthy, white, right? Santa Barbara is where all the wealthy Hollywood folks go to either live or go to vacation, right? That's where the broadcasting epicenter and, and entertainment enter, epicenter of the world is, right? So these folks that are expert at telling stories, expert at doing visuals, expert, their, their vacation place is getting oiled and they're like, what the hell, right? So the media um, do this unprecedented job of investigation, of communicating the tragedy, of, of highlighting all this stuff, and it goes, it goes uh, crazy. So first, President Nixon's like, well, whatever, you know, who cares, there's some oil. And then the pressure gets so heavy, and this is repeated again and again and again. It's repeated with President, the first President Bush, it's repeated with President Obama, it's re repeated with uh, Kamala Harris, who was then our Attorney General, and the few who have. After a while, the politicians are like, oh, I gotta go down. They don't know what the hell they're doing, but it's important that they show up. So they show up and they walk on the beach and they go, oh yeah, it's oil, it sucks, you know. So, so, so Nixon is eventually shamed to coming out and, and trying to do damage control and look like he's doing something, right? Um, uh, uh, people start doing protests. This is a, a bunch of young ladies go to the airport and people weren't paying attention to them, so then they take off all their clothes. So there's all these naked people at the airport and they're like, well, I'm taking a picture of that. And then they have all these signs about oil drilling. The local school, San Marcos High, was getting ready to do their, which is this lower left thing, was getting ready to do their um, 
a high school play and you know now everything's chaotic it would be just like the thomas fire it's exactly like what happened with the thomas fire or the woolsey fire all of a sudden everybody shut down school shut down you, horrible stuff in the air you can't do anything and people are pissed and so the students write throughout throughout the play they're going to do and they write their own play it's a melodrama right so the old like the old dude twiddling his you know long mustache kind of thing mm -hmm. but now the the poor widow victim is a is a lady named Barbara, right? The symbology is very hidden here. I know you can't figure it out. And then the evil, the evil uh, one threatening her is this drippy oil baron who has oil leaking off of him, right? So it's seeping everywhere. It's getting into the, the, the young people's culture. It's the old people's culture. It's in the national media. People are like, what is going on? Why is this thing that's supposed to be a, a benign thing, a helpful thing, causing all of this, all these problems? Okay. So uh, real quickly, uh, the primary flow was only for 11 days, meaning the main kind of stuff burbling out. They tried to jam stuff down into the straw to, to plug it up, and that worked a little bit, and they kept jamming stuff, and they essentially cracked open the seafloor more. So then it started bubbling. So there was oil that was leaking out for at least a year, um, but, but not as intense as it was the first 11 days. Um, uh, yeah, so media circus. Key thing is, it there's many key things here, but one of the most important ones for us is that it crystallizes the modern environmental movement. So oil, sp so one, people are worried, but at the same time this is happening, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio catches fire for the fifth time, fourth time or fifth time, I can't remember, fourth or fifth time. And people are like, wait a second, the rivers aren't supposed to be burning and the beaches aren't supposed to be covered in dead birds and oil. Like what is going on? So these two, there's, there's, there's many things, but these two events viscerally ticked people off. And so this really kicked the environmental movement into high gear. And it really set up, as we just have been talking about, it set up the narrative that we've been locked into ever since. And I would argue we've been ha hamstrung by this because everybody automatically thinks that the other side is evil and everybody thinks automatically the other side can't possibly think like they do and it sends us, sends us into our corners. So the narrative is either um, uh, you know, greedy oil versus poor little birds or it's greedy oil versus not in my backyard and virus. So these various groups start, such as Goo, Get Oil Out, which is an environmental group in, in Santa Barbara. And uh, the folks going to the protest were usually driving in their big lug, 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 you know, 1965 gas guzzler to the protest saying, we want oil out, right? So, so that some people said, oh, those guys are all hypocrites. They don't really want oil out. They just don't want oil in their backyard. So it sets up all these not helpful characterizations of the other side. Nevertheless, every single oil story since then follows this same narrative. Every single one. Um, okay, and then we're getting, we're getting late on time. Um, so I'll speed up a little bit here. I'll just say, so um, then the next realization is, is what is it doing to the environment? What's the toxicity that's happening? And short version is we don't really know for most of it because we didn't have pr before data. We weren't counting the fish in the best way. We weren't counting the kelp in the best way. So when the oil came and killed stuff, people were like, oh, you killed all the seaweed and the oil companies are like really can you show me the data I'm like well i don't have the data before like, oh you don't have the data before oh uh huh so so we don't have a great estimate but this sets the tone for all future oil spills and sets us down a path of doing before monitoring for oil spills so we have these future impacts we can actually know what happened long story short the worry focused on birds, marine mammals, and intertidal invertebrates. Intertidal stuff is where the oil is washing up on and those barnacles and stuff are getting covered in oil. Those guys clearly died. Obviously we saw the birds and we saw the, the seals and things like that get hurt. So that's where the focus really was. Um, what emerged from this, from a study from the University of Southern California that wasn't all that great, but they tried to do the best they could. Um, the, every, at the time was saying, oh my God, the world's gonna end. All the fisheries are done. Nobody's ever going to go hang out on the beach anymore in Santa Barbara, and the economy's done. And then, you know, a few months afterwards, next year, people are back at the beach. The fishermen are out catching fish. So people are saying, oh, all those fears were way overblown. The reality was, as was, which is so often with our um, oil spills, we weren't looking in the right place. 
So the story that emerged, which is what we've also, many academics have been locked into, and I would suggest incorrectly as well. So this is, this is the narrative of the, the general public. The narrative scientists are that, um, so eukaryotes um, are, you know, so, so um, things like you and I, we've evolved tolerance to oil. Because again, we've had these naturally occurring oil seeps in this area, and there's a similar thing in the Gulf of Mexico. So people are like, hey, these critters have evolved with oil. It's cool. They can handle oil. And so, uh, so we can tolerate it by the whales learn to sniff it and swim away or something like that. The microbial critters can actually consume that oil. And it's all good for them. Don't you worry about it. It's okay. Um, the next thing that happened was we had a couple storms in that 11-day period, and it broke up some of the surface slick. So people are like, that's great. It broke up the surface slick, and it went down to the bottom of the ocean. So it's all good, right? As if the bottom of the ocean doesn't need protection as well. So the, uh, this extreme focus on the skin of the ocean and the edge of the ocean. And then, um, and the, uh, yeah, so then as I mentioned, that, that crude mostly went down. A lot of it went down. Even though we see stuff in the intertidal, we see stuff on the beach, and we think that's the whole story, there's a lot more stuff that we couldn't see. Um, all right, we're running out of time. I'll, just, I'll skip that. I'll just say that this really helped usher in the modern era of environmental law. So these are all examples of things that came out pretty much directly or were massively fueled by the Santa Barbara oil spill. So the first is the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which creates things like environmental impact reports that we have to do whenever we're going to do some type of uh, activity like a, a, a mining operation or something like that. The, the same thing in California, which is, we abbreviate CEQA, the same version, we have to do a study of is this going to impact the air or what have you. Santa Barbara County has a division within their planning department, a petroleum unit. It is the most powerful such agency in the world. Um, and that was all because of what they were confronted. So they created this level, they have, when an oil spill happens in Ventura County, they don't talk to the county of Ventura. County of Ventura get to sort of come in and sit in the background. They go, can we help? When an oil spill happens in Santa Barbara, the county of Santa Barbara is a key player in the decision-making process. Virtually nowhere else do we see that um, in the US. Um, Earth Day gets going in 1970, um, and it, we've been doing it every year since. From some folks in Michigan started the idea, and it really blew up after the, the oil spill. Um, the, the, uh, President Nixon starts the federal agency, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in 1970. Um, we passed Prop 20 to create the Coastal Commission, which if you guys talked about the Coastal Commission yet in here? No. So uh, the U.N. has called the Coastal Commission the most powerful land management agency in the world. So it's incredibly powerful. Um, and no time to talk about it now, but, but it influences stuff right along the coast. This was passed by proposition. People said, we should do this. And the politician said, yeah, no. So using the, the, ballot, uh, the ballot box, using propositions, we passed this and created it. And then you see down, uh, where is it? You see down here in 1974, and the politician's like, wow, yeah, that's uh, pretty good. Everybody voted for it, so we'll do it. So then they passed a law called the, called, called the California Coastal Act that codified that and wrote that into our state constitution. So it started in 72, and, it was, and the current form is, is from 1974. Um, and then we have things like the Endangered Species Act, which passes in 1973. We had some predecessors before then, but the current version that you and I know basically started in 1973. There are others, but these are some of the classic things. This is known as the golden era, the, 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 the high point of modern environmental regulation. I should say that when things like the Endangered Species passed, it was 98 people in the Senate voted for it. Right? This wasn't this sort of divisive thing like we have now, like this, this group is pro this and that group is anti that. It was much more bipartisan and everybody realized because in part of this, this new stuff that was coming through their, their feeds every day. One quick note on the Exxon spill. This is a, a tanker. It's leaving, so we have the, the big oil fields in the north slope of Alaska, goes across this across Alaskan pipeline, fills up, put it in the tanker and we take the tanker down to West Coast refineries. Hazel with the, the captain, a um, little drinky drinky, too much, and was down in his cabin um, when he should have been on the bridge and subordinate officer was driving the, the ship, ran aground, ripped open, let all this oil go in 1989 to Exxon Sound and caused all these problems. This is the gold standard for 
how to understand what happened with an oil spill. So um, for reasons you can talk about me later, but we, we learned a lot of things and, uh, and we set up what's now known as a trustee council. So now it's not one agency or whatever, it's a group of folks, including people like the fishermen, including people like Native American tribes, et cetera, and they have a voice as to how we're gonna respond to this oil spill. Again, just like the Santa Barbara spill, even though it happened you know, offshore, the story was all the intertidal. The story were the beaches. What was going on with the beaches? And here's all this oiled uh, beach up on the coast of Alaska. And then the key thing for us, just to mention, is, the, is OPA 90. This is really the, the, the policy with which we live now. So this is, it stands for the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Um, when the Exxon spill happened, um, well, yeah, birds were killed, but the big, the big um, <coughs> iconic thing from the Exxon spill were sea otters, killed sea otters. And so at the time, it was, oh, you killed some sea otters. So the process at the time was you hire a bunch of economists and you say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Economist, how, um, how much does a, does a uh, sea otter cost? And they did some economic stuff and, uh, and they're like, oh, sea otter cost, they're like $5,000 or, or whatever it was, right? And they're like, okay, how many sea otters we killed? We killed like 200 sea otters. Okay, so 5,000 times 200, that's what we have to pay for that. OPA 90 changes that. So OPA 90 says you, the, the, the responsible party, meaning in this case the oil company that spilled it, uh, you, so if we decided we, or if we measured that we killed 200 sea otters or whales or whatever it is, you have to make me 200 more sea otters. Ready, set, go. So if you can do that by setting up a captive breeding program and playing a bunch of barrier white and getting, you know, sea otters, make more sea otters, I'm like, that's fine. If you have to um, spend 20 years and $100 million making more sea otters, tough shit, right? So the onus goes on to the spilling party, not to do some random number of, of dollars, but to actually replace the resource that was, that was damaged. Um, and so that's essentially what, what we have now. And uh, I'll just say that uh, by give you a quick sense of what happened with the Deepwater Horizon. Um, this is Louisiana. If anybody's, I'm not, well, yeah, I'm on sabbatical. So I'm taking alumni this year. But if you guys are interested next year, we do a trip every year. But this is, um, offshore of Louisiana. These are the pipelines for the oil and gas industry there. These are the uh, shallow water wellheads. These are the mostly natural gas wellheads inland, in the middle of their national parks, everywhere. This is, this is oil and gas central. Uh, this wellhead blew up for, and I have a bunch of videos you can look at if you're curious, but long story short, what happened was I was my fascination with beaches and wetlands, I was part of the problem. So I used my old experience with Santa Barbara and Exxon and all these things, as did most of us. And we said, oh my God, this oil rig, you know, a mile down in the ocean, that the, 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 the straw broke essentially, and that oil was leaking out, what's gonna go on? And people like me like, oh my God, the wetlands, the wetlands, the wetlands, we're gonna kill the wetlands. Because we were using this old paradigm that the oil would float to the surface and then it would kill the birds, it would kill the mammals, and then it would, and then it would wash on the shore and have all these impacts on shore. We just assumed the same thing was gonna happen even though the, the oil was coming from much deeper. Turns out that's not what happened. What happened was the oil, the oil it was so deep and so pressurized, and, and there's a lot of people there, such as now the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Louisiana, uh -huh. um, who was then what's known as the parish <laughs> president for one of the parishes we work on. They, they, have county, they have parishes instead of counties in Louisiana. So he famously got up and said, we're not stupid. We know what happens when you mix oil and water, the oil floats. Yeah, he was stupid because <laughs> oil and gas doesn't float. Oil doesn't float when it's that pressure and that temperature. So actually the oil, if it just came out on its own, it would just flop onto the onto the bottom of the ocean. What was going on is the Deepwater Horizon was mostly a natural gas spill. And the oil was a small, the, the crude oil was a small fraction of that. What was going on is it was squirting out of this tube so fast, the, the fire hose effect drew the oil up. Instead of going to the surface, some of it went to the surface, of course, we had oil on the surface, absolutely. But most of it got to a, a, a couple, a thousand, uh, feet or so above the wellhead and just became neutrally buoyant and hung out there. 
And so we were doing all stuff. We're adding dispersant in the water. We're, we, we consume one third of the global supply of dispersant, which is like a detergent for oil. And we're like, we're so smart because there's no oil up here. Wow. The oil was never going to be up there. It couldn't get up there. And so it hung out down below. And, um, and yeah, it has all kinds of problems. And when we think about these oil spills, as you guys are thinking about this in the future, it's important to think about all this stuff together, this interdisciplinary approach. So one, it would have helped us avoid some problems with the Deepwater Horizon and everything else, but we really need this new type of thinking. And one example of that is to always get new data when we have an oil spill. So this, these are some of our surveys we're doing that Dr. Steele and a bunch of your, your previous, stu your previous uh, fellow students were helping us with. This is how much oil landed on the beach with the refugio oil spill. So the oil went offshore and people are like, aha, all good, it's gone. And then a day or two later, people started, all of a sudden these tar balls started washing up in Manhattan Beach. These tar balls started washing up in Santa Monica. These tar balls started washing up in Ventura. People are like, that's weird. That normally doesn't happen. And so um, long story short, we went out and checked it out. And this is, this is a lot of tar balls on the beach. This is no tar balls on the beach. And so um, we blended ecological data, environmental data, with, with economic data. And so this is how far, of all these beaches, we sampled 33 beaches, and this is you know, a clean beach, a dirty beach. How far did you drive to get to the beach today, people that were recreating on the beach? And the long story short, there's no significant effect. People went, people went um, drove as far to a, a, a dirty beach as a clean beach. This is how much money they spent in coastal businesses. So while everybody drove to the beach the same distance, when it was oil, they got there and went, F this, right? Huge ramifications for our hotels, huge ramifications for mom and pop selling the taco at the, on the taco stand, all kinds of knock-on effects. If we don't have this data, just like before, if we don't have the data, we can't tell what was going on with the Santa Barbara oil spill. If we don't have this data, we can't tell what's going on to our communities that are affected by oil and gas spills. And so with that, I'll say thanks a lot, and um, I'll give the slides to Dr. Steele.